Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondine, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of a tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act would be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing pole. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the onlookers. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on stilts. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelette. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. The crowd cheered louder. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tightrope in this wheelbarrow? Yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in, replied Blondin. The crowd fell silent. But the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? Asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. So there actually are some historical inaccuracies with that. Um, but the general basis of that story is actually true. Um, Charles Blondin was uh, a, someone who tightroped across uh, Niagara Falls many times. And as he had done so, he became increasingly more daring. And at one point, he asked the crowd, do you believe that I can carry someone over in a wheelbarrow? And they all said, yes, we believe. Then he said, would anyone like to volunteer? Not a single hand went up. And there was an awkwardness in the crowd because they had realized that he had just kind of pointed out their hypocrisy. And one man raised his hand. He said, I volunteer. That was his manager. And instead of actually going into the wheelbarrow, he piggybacked him across. And as he was piggybacking him, this is kind of, the story is kind of crazy, but the man was 140 pounds. As he, I think Blondine was slightly more than that. And as he's walking across, he realized he was getting extremely tired. He started to sweat a lot. And so he stopped at, at a point, and it was at a point where there were these wires that just held these wires stable, the, wire, the main wire stable, and he stopped at that point and he said, I'm going to need you to get off, right? And the guy's like, what? Right? Um, he, so he gets off and he rests for a while, picks him up, and he starts running across the wire because he realized there's no other way he's going to make it. Right? He, was going to be, he was just too tired. So he starts running across. He's sweating profusely, gets to the other side, and finally makes it across. That there is faith. You see, because when we talk about what it means to believe in someone, it's very simple for us to say, yes, I believe. It's very simple for us to come together as a crowd of people wanting to watch the spectacle. It's very easy for us to want to see what can happen, what is possible. But it's difficult to be the one that will say, I'll do it. It's difficult to actually not just believe in, but put their trust in. Even in faith, there's a struggle. But you know, here's this thing. Halfway through, as Blondine is starting to sweat and get tired, and he tells the man, tells his manager, I need you to get off. This manager never had a moment's thought of saying, nah, I'm good, I got it. And just when he slips off, says, you go ahead, I'll follow behind you. He would never even think to say that, right? Because he has no ability to do it on his own. 
You see, faith means that we trust in not just for the moment, but for the entire way. Because the reality is putting our trust in our God means that we trust him not just for the moment, but the entire way. When we talk about what it means to love, when, it, when we talk about what it means to love, the important thing for us to understand is this. Trust, as we talk about trust, is something that we need to place in God, not just with our lips, but actually in our actions, to say to him, God, I believe in you, I trust in you, more than just knowing in my mind that you are God, but actually getting in or hopping on your back actually putting my hope and my trust entirely in you. As you know, we've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to continue in this. Today we get to the point where it says, love always trusts. But I do not, but if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I might boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. And as we understand what it means for us to know that love always trusts, I come to this realization that there is this hand-in-hand -hand relationship between love always protects and love always trusts. Because we cannot trust in someone that we do not feel is protecting us. And if we can't come to this understanding then of who God is, that God is a God who is, who is always protecting us, then we have this ability to hope and trust in that God. You see, the reality is we have no choice. We've already come midway to, through the Niagara Falls, and we're standing there in the balancing act and saying, are we going to hop on or not? We're already midway through our lives, and there is no way that we can actually get through on our own. The reality is we don't have that capacity. Some of us truly feel as though we are on this tight wire. Right? Some of us truly feel as though our lives can feel that way because there are these moments in our hearts and our lives when it feels as though we're just out of control. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that it's dangerous and it's risky. We don't know what's going to happen and what's going to come in our lives, but we know that we're somewhat afraid. Some of our college students who just graduated know exactly what that feels like. I remember when I graduated from college and um, kind of the whole future was open before me. And you would think that it, it meant that I was excited. You would think that it meant that I couldn't wait to go out and conquer the world. But the reality was, I was terrified. I wasn't sure of what I was going to do. I wasn't sure of how I was going to live. I wasn't sure of what my life was going to hold. But I knew that I wanted to honor God and live for him. The reality is, for each one of us, whether you are just graduating college or somewhere in the middle of your life, we're still in the same situation, aren't we? We don't actually have any genuine control over our future. We don't actually have any security that we can actually place our hope in other than to know that Christ and Christ alone has our lives. What we are doing and what we must do is get on and piggyback on our Lord who is going to get us all the way to the end. Because love always trust. See, when we talk about the trust that we have in Christ, it leads us to this understanding that the reason why we can trust is because God has the ability to save. We need to know that because when God talks about protection, that love is always protecting us, it's his love that causes us to know this, and this is how he demonstrates it. 
In Isaiah 53, one of the more, fa- more, more famous verses or chapters that we find in terms of the Old Testament talking about who Jesus is, this is what it says. Surely he took, upon, took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, what this is saying is this. There was a punishment for sin, and each one of us were guilty of it. Each one of us were deserving of it. But instead of that punishment landing on us, falling on us, it fell upon Christ. It comes with the $50 word, propitiation. One of these words that seem very difficult to understand, but so simple when we just understand what it's saying. And I believe it's just simply in this. There is the wrath of God that Christ has taken, and we stand trusting in his protection behind the cross. The wrath of God that Christ has taken upon himself so that we ourselves may be protected. And so the only way for us truly to be protected is to trust. The only way for us to truly be protected, to be covered by this grace, is to trust and stand in his shadow. It's for us to be able to say, look, if this was an umbrella, right, God opens up a giant umbrella, that's the grace of God, that's his mercy, then the rain falls on the whole world except for those who are standing under the umbrella. Now, if I, in my own mind, say to myself, "Ah, I don't really need this umbrella. I don't know if it's going to be strong enough. I don't know if it's going to be good enough. And I step out from underneath the umbrella, the wrath of God will fall on me. It's by grace, but it is also by trust that we are required to, call to, place our hope and our trust in God. It's not always easy, but it's the thing that causes us to be able to know with absolute certainty that not only are we, are we saved, but also that we are safe. So this is what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. Amen. I want you to think about what that's saying. Because there is a route, there is a road that Christ is leading us to. And there, oftentimes it feels like that tightrope. There are times when we just don't know how we are going to cross that huge divide. This passage tells us, trust in the Lord. With all of your heart, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord because he is able. Trust in the Lord because he is good. Trust in the Lord because those two are so necessary in our understanding of what it means for us to get from point A to point B, from our current life to the life that God has called us to. So trust in the Lord. When we rely on our own understanding, there are times when that trust becomes all that more difficult. When I rely on my understanding, there are things that get in the way from me truly being able to see the full picture. And because of that, I don't quite get it. There are these moments in my life when God will say to me, okay, I want you to step out. And I'll say, but to where? And how? And God will assure me and promise me, everything will be fine. I've got you. I'll take care of you. And I will say, but show me. Because in my mind, I trust myself more than I trust God. That's the reality. In my own mind, I feel like I need it to be reasonable to me even more than it needs to be reasonable to God. And God says, that's not trust. Trust in me. Step out. There are these moments in our lives when God calls us to take this huge, in our minds we calculate, and it's this huge risk. 
But if we understand that God sees the whole picture, if we understand that God knows it all and he's calling you out, we realize it's not a risk at all, for it's in his hands. So in all of your ways, submit to him. In all of your ways, be willing to surrender your will to God's will. In all of your ways, be willing to actually acknowledge, God, you are greater than I am. You know more than I am, and you hold the whole world in your hands. And so I'm going to submit and trust in you. And that's when he makes your path straight. In all of your ways, as you, as you submit to him. And I want you to recognize what it says. It says, in all of your ways. There are these times when I feel like, I got it from here. I'm good. I got it from here. And I just kind of feel like I, I start to know. I, I kind of understand. God's like, no. I don't want you to feel like you can trust yourself because the reality is you just can't. Trust in me. Trust in me. See, what the, rea the, the reason why I believe that the idea of trust is so important is because trust is one of the most important building blocks of any form of relationship, isn't it? Be whether it's between friends or husband and wife, children and their parents, trust is that building block. And so the reason why... When you feel betrayed, it's usually because of a breaking of the trust. Whether it be because of adultery or because of a, of a secret that went told to everyone else, it's that breaking of the trust that we recognize to be a reason that split and, de and destroyed relationship. What we must do then is to rebuild that trust. I remember having conversations with my kids when they would lie. And you know, all kids, they do lie. Um, I remember having this conversation and talking to them and saying, you know, when you lie to me, it makes you a liar. Because basically, that's what you call someone who lies. You are a liar. And when you are a liar, that means that I don't want to trust you because you are identified now as a liar. And so if I can't trust you, whatever you say to me, I will always wonder, are you telling me the truth? I will always wonder, is, this, is what this person is telling me, is that something that I can actually believe or should I choose not to believe? And because of that, as much as I want to walk alongside with you and be with you, what's going to happen is every single time you tell me something, I choose not to believe you, you're going to put a distance between us. That's the reality with our friendships. That's the reality between husband and wife. That's the reality in every relationship that we have. Every human relationship and every spiritual relationship. That when our trust with God, when we choose not to trust God, it begins to foster this sort of relationship where we begin to separate from him. Love always trusts. We, trusting in God, trusting in his protection over us, we place our lives in his hands. And we say, okay, God, more than just believing that you are sovereign, more than believing that you are able. I want to trust, because love always trusts. Let's pray together. As we come before the Lord in prayer,